evening, everyone. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, the Executive Director here at the Institute of Politics. As David mentioned earlier, we are very pleased to welcome Valerie Jarrett this evening. Copies of her new book are, sale, are for sale outside, and she will be doing a signing after the discussion. Thank you to our partners at International House for helping us make this program possible. A few upcoming events I wanted to mention. Next Monday, I will be moderating a panel conversation on how America's schools are doing and where reform efforts need to go from here. This will be with former US Secretary of Education John King, who is a Pritzker Fellow at the IOP this quarter, and Chicago Public Schools CEO Janice Jackson, as well as San Antonio Superintendent Pedro Martinez. Next Thursday, two of the nation's most effective political organizers, I. Jen Poo and George Gale, will discuss their strategies for winning fights to change millions of lives for the better and the most pressing organizing challenges of our time. You can find out more about these and other upcoming events at our website at politics.uchicago.edu. A few notes on tonight's program. After the podcast, we will um, open up the floor to take 15 minutes worth of questions from the audience. We would ask you to line up uh, behind the microphone that's going to be just off to the side. We're going to try something new tonight, a little boy, girl, boy, girl in the questions. And we will give um, priority for the first three questions, as usual, to students. And because we have limited time, I would like to ask for very brief questions that end in a question mark so that we can get as, through as many as possible. Please, again, make sure your phones are on silent if you haven't already. And here to formally introduce our speaker is Chahat Coppola. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Oh, sorry, I forgot. The, I, I don't, don't welcome her just yet. I forgot to describe her. Chahat has been extremely <laughs> engaged at the IOP. She is a third year from New Delhi, studying economics and political science. During her time at the IOP, she has worked as a speaker series intern, helping us put on events like this, and as a member of the International Policy Program Committee. And this year, she is the events chair on our student advisory board. And now, please welcome her to the podium. A very good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Today, the IOP is indeed privileged to have as our distinguished guest the longest serving senior advisor to President Obama, who's often described as the first friend to the President and Mrs. Obama. It is my absolute honor to introduce Ms. Valerie Jarrett this evening. As senior advisor, she oversaw the offices of public engagement and intergovernmental affairs in the Obama administration. A role model for women, in, for women in America, Ms. Jarrett chaired the White House Council on Women and Girls at the, and the White House Task Force to protect students from sexual assault. A true American businesswoman, she also serves on the board of directors of Lyft, 2U, and the Kennedy Center of Performing Arts, among others. She is also currently the senior advisor to Obama Foundation and ATTN. Our university today proudly boasts of having her as the former chairman of the University of Chicago Medical Center and now a distinguished senior fellow at the University of Chicago Law School. Ms. Jarrett has received numerous awards and honorary degrees, including Time's 100 Most Influential People. Having grown up in Chicago, she began her remarkable journey in politics in Mayor Harold Washington's administration. A little over three decades later, Today, she stands as one of the most influential African-American women of the 21st century. We all welcome her today at the live recording of The Axe Files, hosted by Institute Director David Axelrod, to talk about her new book, Finding My Voice, My Journey to the West Wing and the Paths Beyond. Please welcome David Axelrod and Valerie Jar uh, Jarrett. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for that introduction. Good to <laughs> well, be home. Welcome to the Axe Files, live recording of the Axe Files. And, and welcome home, uh, Valerie Jarrett. You, you spent a good number of years of your life here in this community. Right here in this community. I went to the lab school, which you can see if you look out the window. And I was just here not that long ago with uh, Mike Stratmanis from the Obama Center speaking to the public policy students. And so it's great to be back on campus and good to see you all. So we've known each other for, 
for 30 years or so. Goodness gracious. You were 10. I was a, you were I was 10 a, when I we met. I was a toddler, yes. I think. Yeah, you were 10. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, the thing about reading your book uh, is that um, I learned so much about you. I knew you had this extraordinary family history, but I didn't quite remember how extraordinary. And one thing that uh, you went, you back, we went back five or something generations to your great, 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 grandfather who was a, a slave owner, uh, a white slave owner, and, and, you're, and, and he had a child with an enslaved woman, uh, and that was your great, 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 great grandmother, and you don't, you, you, you still to this day don't know her name. No, we don't, and that's part of the problem with uh, slavery, one of many problems, right? Uh, but it was actually my, my great my great-grandfather, uh, whose father was born a slave, freed as a result of the Civil War, and becomes a carpenter and saves enough money to send his son to MIT in 18, uh, 1888. And he was the first African-American to go to MIT. And I often thought, David, like, what was that train ride like for my great-grandfather? And what was it like for his father to have been born a slave and have had the vision to say, Education is important, and if I want my son to do far, far better than I, then I should use my life savings to pay for his education. And then what was it like when he got to MIT and was with white colleagues who probably had had no experience with a black person other than taking care of their children or cleaning their homes before? Uh, and so anytime I would get nervous, I would just think of like, well, it is nothing compared to what my great-grandfather went through. One, one of the, I mean, he became the first uh, black uh, architect in, in the country, in the yeah. country, and was uh, assigned by Booker T. Washington to uh, develop the Tuskegee Institute. Yes, at Tuskegee, Alabama. It's now called Tuskegee University, but back then it was an institute. And he designed many of the buildings on the campus. In fact, several still stand today. And his favorite was a was a chapel that burned down, and then they rebuilt it exactly as he had originally designed it. And his students in the school there, uh, who helped him with the design of the buildings, uh, had to not only build their dorms, but they had to make the bricks that built the dorms. So anytime people complain about life on campus today, at least you're not like making bricks and building dorms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and then he lived there until he retired, and then he went back to Wilmington. And your grandfather uh, was a major figure here in this city, Robert Taylor. Uh, who was a, an advocate for affordable housing. Um, he developed housing uh, in Bronzeville, which was a, a, a predominantly African-American community. Um, but just as an aside on that, you wrote about these incredible people who lived there uh, in the day, uh, celebrated figures in the arts and in athletics, Joe Lewis and... Uh, and uh, well, one of the consequences Lorraine, yeah. of the restrictive covenants that existed as the law in Chicago and around the country back then is that black people could only live in certain communities. And so in this Rosenwald building that my grandfather managed, you had everybody from Pullman porters to doctors and lawyers to figures that have turned out to be celebrities, and it's because they couldn't leave. And, uh, and one of the consequences when those restrictive covenants lifted is that everybody who could then afford to move out did and left behind a very poor community that is still trying to experience a rebirth today. And in fact, the Rosenwald building fell into terrible disarray for decades and now has been renovated. Uh, and my father, who grew up in Washington, D.C., also very segregated during the Jim Crow era, went to Dunbar High School. And Dunbar High School was one of the best high schools in the country. I see somebody nodding back there. Uh, at the time, because black professionals who were trained and should have been able to teach at the best universities, couldn't get jobs there. And so you had an extraordinary richness in educators who were limited to teaching in high school. So my father got one of the best educations possible as a result of these restrictions on black people. I want to talk about him in a, in a second because he had his own illustrious uh, history. But um, uh, your, your, your grandfather, Robert Taylor, was the first uh, African-American chairman of the Chicago Housing Authority, appointed in 1940. Uh, and he, uh, he battled for affordable housing and ended up uh, quitting in a dispute over 
housing policy. Talk a little bit about that. Well, his vision uh, for public housing is that it should be a temporary way station, that there should be um, people who should be allowed to live in low density homes with gardens and um, designed architecturally to blend into the urban fabric, and that it was the responsibility of government to help them get on their feet, and whether it was social services or job training or whatever was required so that they could move through in this temporary way, way station and then and then move out. And he tried mightily to convince the Chicago City Council to build housing in communities were not, that were not 100% black. And he met a lot of resistance. And there were political reasons for why people wanted all the black people located in one area. And then there were just social... Including, including some of the black politicians. Yes, yes, they liked the bloating block all in one place. And so you knew you could count on that block. Yes, the so black politicians were equally culpable, and so he resigned in frustration. And uh, years after his death, in 1962, Mayor Richard J. Daley dedicated the Robert Taylor Homes in his name. And for those of you who are new to Chicago, you might not know it, but for decades, the Robert Taylor Homes was the largest public housing development in the world, one of the most notorious. A series high-rise buildings. It was like 16 high-rises all along uh, the Dan Ryan Expressway that had been acquired through urban renewal. And so you had 100% poor people, predominantly black, living in the community without any of the social services that my grandfather would have, um, would have wanted. Uh, and it stuck out like a sore thumb on our, on our city's um, Bounded Skyline. by the expressway. The expressway on one side, exactly, and isolating. That created a barrier, actually, between the communities on either side of the expressway when it was built. How did you feel about that, about that, being a, that development being associated with your grandfather? Well, I remember the dedication. So, all right, I'm telling you my age uh, in 1962, but viv but there not goes the vividly. we met when you were 10. Exactly, though. exactly. But I was only six, and what I remember was this mixed feeling of. It was a celebration, and Mayor Jay Daly was giving the keys to a very happy family that was moving out of, as David, you would remember, dilapidated tenements into this new housing, so the families were happy. My grandmother felt like she was standing there with Richard J. Daly. My book has a photograph of the ceremony, but I did overhear my mom and my aunt talking, and my grandmother certainly weighed on this much um, a great deal later, that this was not my grandfather's vision. Uh, and, and doubted whether it would be successful. So yeah, the buildings were brand new that day, but what would they be a year from then or 10 years from now or 30 years? And I tell a story in my book about sitting in my grandmother's little front room looking at the 10 o'clock news. And uh, every time Robert Taylor Holmes was mentioned, it was associated with a crime. Nothing good, no good news ever came out of the Robert Taylor Holmes. And it didn't adequately represent many of the families who worked there who were completely law-abiding citizens but it did represent an element of crime uh, that captured the attention of the news. One of the, uh, one of the really interesting turns uh, of history is that it was Richard M. Daly who decided to uh, tear down the Robert Taylor Homes, and it was one Valerie Jarrett who, as his planning commissioner, uh, was involved in that project. So you ended up tearing down a development that was named for your grandfather. Yes, and that was the opposite of what he would have believed in. And I had the incredible opportunity to work on what um, was not possible in the 40s. And I think my, grandmother my grandfather was just a man before his time. And his vision is really now what we're seeing happening around the city, where not just the Robert Taylor Homes was torn down, but all of the high-rise developments that was a social experiment that simply didn't work have now been torn down and being replaced back on site with mixed income housing where you have both public housing, affordable housing, market rate housing, indistinguishable architecturally so that it does bl blend back into the, into the urban fabric. Just talk about your, uh, your parents, both of whom have uh, celebrated, had celebrated uh, careers. Uh, your father, uh, Dr. Jim Bowman, noted pathologist. Um, and, and of course, your, your mom, uh, Barbara Bowman, one of the foremost experts on childhood development and education uh, in the country. But I want to talk about your dad for a second uh, and what he confronted as a, he was educated at Howard University, educated uh, in their medical school, came here first, I guess, to Provident Hospital, which was a, 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 a 
a black institution, mm -hmm. but he moved to St. Luke's Hospital, which was not. What, what did he confront there? Well, he was uh, excited to be admitted for his residency at St. Luke's. He was the first African-American to be admitted, but they had rules, and one of the rules was that he couldn't live in the dorm on campus. Now, everyone who knows anything about, med about being a resident, you know you're on call all the time, you work these ridiculous hours, and he used to have to take a, a streetcar to Bronzeville uh, and live in the black community while his white counterparts were able to just fall out of bed and be right there. Uh, they also told him that he couldn't come in the front door. And my dad said, that's a bridge too far. I competed, I was accepted, I am going to come in the front door. And so he walked in the front door the first day and you know, the world did not come to an end. And, then and in fact, the rest of the employees the next day, all of the rest of the black employees, from the orderlies to the nurses to whoever, staff that worked there, were waiting for him, as the story goes, and walked in the front door together. And Chicago was like that back then. It had a kind of a spotty history, and, and it was on the verge of making change, but there were these legacy uh, vestiges of Jim Crow that my father experienced. You always were more polite about these things yes. than me. It, it, I don't, it wasn't even a spotty history. It was a... It was a history of uh, segregation. Dr. King came here in the 60s and, uh, a and confronted that. And your family uh, confronted as well and actually left the country uh, to get away from it. You are not, I am not a birther. This is a fact. You can read about it in the book. You were born. I was actually not born in this country, yeah. Exactly. Unlike you, President you were Obama, who was. born in Iran. I was born in Iran, so, in Iran, so my dad, when he finished his residency, he went to the army and uh, lived in Denver a couple, for a couple of years. By then, he'd met my mother, fallen in love, gotten married, and so off to Denver they went. And when he was leaving the army, he was looking for a job at an academic teaching institution like the University of Chicago, and he couldn't find a position anywhere comparable to his white counterparts. And so he and my mother, who were pretty adventurous in spirits, thought, well, let's look outside of the United States. If there's not an opportunity here uh, for you, let's see what else, there, what else there might be. And they heard about a position that was available to help start a new hospital in Shiraz, Iran. Uh, and they asked my dad to be the chairman of the Department of Pathology. Again, the position not available to him here. And at that point, um, obviously, I hope it's obvious to you, the United States had far better diplomatic relations with Iran than they do today. And in fact, their public health department was looking to start hospitals and recruit physicians from all over the world to share best practices with the Iranian doctors. And my dad always made the point it was a two-way street. He learned as much from the Iranian doctors who were confronting illnesses that we don't have here and solving, curing them. Uh, and so I grew up my first five years on a hospital compound with children from all over the world. And we spoke French, and we spoke English, and Farsi, and sometimes all in the same sentence. And, and it was a wonderfully cosmopolitan place. And my father went from being an African-American, or in that case, a Negro doctor, to becoming an American doctor, where he was evaluated based on the merit of what he did. And it changed him and gave him a confidence level um, that that allowed me to be born and live in those first five years with a father who really knew his value and his merit and was competing on a far more equal playing field. From there, he caught the attention, his research that he did on fava beans, and we won't go there, but he did very important research on fava beans, caught the attention of a, the person who led the Galton Labs at University College of London. And so when my parents decided it was time to start heading back to the United States, they took a year in London. And from there, he gave a paper at some international conference of uh, the research he was continuing to do. And who was at that conference? The dean of the Medical Center of the University of Chicago, who offered him a tenured track position here. And so my dad used to always say to me growing up, sometimes the shortest distance to where you want to go is actually the longest way around. And the, that if he hadn't been prepared to leave this country, he wouldn't have ended up spending the rest of his career right here at the University of Chicago. He was a colleague of my father-in-law's at the University of Chicago, they were good and they, they had great admiration for each other. Just before we leave the uh, Iran experience, um, what do you remember? You, you say we had better relations, and we did, although it was with the Shah, who uh, there were there were some uh, there there may have been residents of the country who were less happy with it than your experience in that Absolutely. hospital. And you, you, but you're probably too young to remember that, but your parents must have had some 
recollections of that did yes, they yes absolutely and i mean he was he was obviously had great relations with the presidents of the United States, but he also had a Savak military where people just disappeared from time to time. And it was a very class-oriented country as well. People who are my babysitter, who I speak so fondly of, thought nothing of me kicking her when I was five years old. Well, my mother thought a lot about me kicking her, I can assure you of that. And it was part of the impetus for my parents to begin to return to the United States is that that class system was unacceptable to parents who had grown up under Jim Crow. Yeah. What, uh, what was it for you when you were in the White House? And what was it like when the uh, negotiations with Iran uh, were going on? And did you, you must, have, you must have a particular interest in that country. Do you remember any of your Farsi? I do remember a little bit of Farsi, primarily because my mother, who became fluent in Farsi, um, used it uh, when she wanted to speak to me out in public and didn't want anybody to understand what she was saying. And so words like sit down, shut up, those I can tell you right like off the top of my head. But one We of had the, the same thing in my family, but, but it was Yiddish. <laughs> exactly. Uh. You know, uh, but, but I will say to you all that um, when I came to the United States and I started in public school here, I had a British accent because of the year we'd spend in Great Britain. I was from a country nobody had heard of at Shoesmith Elementary School. And I was skipped two grades, so I'm five in second grade. And I used to get beat up every single day after school. And my younger cousin would have to come to my rescue. She had two older siblings, so she'd learned to fight really well. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it, but what I did, and I, it's part of why I had to, I, I reflected on this in my book, is that I stopped speaking Farsi and French. I lost that British accent the first week. And I just wanted to be like all the other kids, right? And I wanted to conform. And I didn't want to say I'm from Iran and have people look at me like, where is that from for the first part of my life? And then, oh my gosh, for the second set. And so uh, when the Iran negotiated, but I, but I went back frequently until I graduated from high school. So I have very vivid memories of Iran. And the last time I went back was, um, well, it must have been six years before the revolution. And what um, my parents, though, who have been back since, uh, after the revolution and after Khomeini was in power, uh, discovered, which President Obama also knew, is that the Iranian people are still the Iranian people. And just because your government might go a different way doesn't necessarily mean you agree with everything that your government is doing. I certainly have appreciated that lately. <laughs> um, and my father tells a story about coming back from Iran, and he went into a shop. And above the shop, it said, we hate the United States in English, um, above the store. And then he went inside and the shopkeeper was like, come on in, come on in, we're glad to see you, what can I sell you? Or he'd go to a party and the women would walk in a door with the chadoras on covering up their faces and then they'd get inside and, you know, low cut blouses and gold jewelry. And, and it just shows you kind of the, the hypocrisy, which is why President Obama, when he was in office, and David, you'll remember this, every year he gave a Nuru's message to the people of Iran. And so even though our governments weren't getting along, he appreciated the culture and the beauty and the richness of, of the Iranian people, um, as do I. Yeah, that's something that's been lost, which is this notion that you can uh, try and move a country by moving its people, uh, and not necessarily through a belligerence uh, that impacts on uh, people. So one, one thing about your experience as a child that, you, that, I, that struck me was that uh, you wrote about the fact that you came home one day and you told your mother, and knowing your mother just a little, I can only imagine how this flew, that uh, you, you wouldn't have to do any more homework, you were told, because you're a smart kid and you don't need to do homework. Yeah, that didn't go over very well in the Bowman household. Uh, I was <laughs> it might have gone over, might go over well at the University of Chicago. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe so. So I was in fourth grade, and we'd had, I think, it's seven teachers in one school year. We and it was third and fourth grade students in the same classroom. Terrible overcrowding. Thirty plus kids in the classroom. Teachers could not manage us whatsoever. And one day, uh, near the end of the school year, my teacher the current teacher, pulled six of us outside of the class. And I was a little nervous with her saying, come on. But I looked at the kids, and I was like, all right, I'm with the smart kids going outside, so how much trouble could we be in? And she said, I just want you to know that no matter what I say to the rest of the class, you guys don't have to do any homework. Well, I thought that was great, right? So I go home, and I'm like, mom, no more homework for me. And she's like, all right, lab school, here you come. 
but it's a it's an example of the overcrowding and the lack of resources and the teacher's desire to then just teach to the mean in the class and not worry about the kids who or challenge intellectually the kids who were smarter and that's one of the travesties of our public education system uh, overcrowding and lack of resources and teachers being asked to do far more than they can possibly do i um i want to ask you about uh another anecdote, parable, story you, you shared about your um, summer in Michigan in summer camp and this, this very hurtful experience that you had there um, at the, just as you were leaving, one of your friends said, what, what, did, what did she say to you? Well, it was an all white camp except for Valerie and because I didn't look white, um, most of the campers had no idea I was black and I, again, I'm trying to fit in, I'm playing with all the kids and she said to me on the last day of camp, as we were packing up in our, our cabin, she said, I'm sorry, I, I have to apologize to you. I, I thought you were, and she used the N-word. And I reacted to it, and I didn't say anything. I just, like, packed up and left. And I think back on it now, it's kind of embarrassing that I didn't speak up for myself and say, yeah, I'm black and I'm proud, and, you know, don't use pejorative names to describe me. But I think, and this happens to people all the time, it's just like easier just to get out of the situation and not get into another fight, because I've already told you I wasn't a good fighter. And your cousins weren't at camp. With and my cousin was not there that yeah. year. She did come the next year, and then she got called the same thing, and, and somebody white came to both of our defense. And I think, so I was in this tension, because of one of the reasons I was getting beat up in, at Shoesmith is I was fair-skinned, and I got beat up by the black kids. And then here I go to camp, and I get, you know, a, you experience racism, and so that's just the nature of growing up, kind of light-skinned black in America. What about the interplay of class and race? Because, you know, um, I, I recited some of the history of your family. It is an illustrious family, and it goes illustrious going back uh, for generations. So um, you weren't raised poor, um, and uh, uh, how, but, and yet, um, race trumps class. Race does trump class. I did learn that in life. Uh, but I also learned that my parents, because of their life experiences, said, look, you're going to have to work twice as hard as everybody else. Uh, you're a woman, you're black, and that's just the way it is. And there wasn't like, you know, any woe is me to it. In fact, my mother, when I would come home and complain about something unfair that had happened in life, she'd say, well, who told you it was fair? And I thought, well, isn't it supposed to be fair? And she goes, yeah, but it's not fair. So just go back and work a little bit harder. And so there was no pity party in our family. There was a sense of responsibility to do the, your very best that you could do and that anything short of measuring yourself by your own standard didn't fit into the equation. And so there was an expectation that maybe sometimes life would not treat you well, but not to orient yourself in that way, to orient yourself by just doing the very best you could do. You obviously took that to heart. You you went to Stanford, flirted with taking a gap year. That uh, didn't fly well with your mother. Barbara Bowman wasn't buying a gap year. I said, well, what about if I just travel in Europe or something? She's like, well, who's paying for that? This is the woman who had calculated how much every class at Stanford cost. And I don't mean the semester. I mean the class. And she handed me a piece of paper with that dollar amount. And she said, you might be tempted to cut school. This is what it will be costing me. So she was really, be, she was, she and my father believed in sacrificing, um, and they were both academics. So no, we weren't poor, but you know, college is expensive. University of Chicago actually paid for a lot of the tuition, but they had to cover the gap. And she wanted me to know what that cost was. So I think those are kind of good values by which to be raised. That we're sacrificing for you. We want you to, um, we are setting high expectations for you, both in terms of how hard you work, but also where your moral compass is. And I couldn't have asked for better parents. My mom, 90, still works full time. Started the, I know, I know. It's like, will I ever Erickson be able to Institute. retire? She started the, she was, she got her master's here from the University of Chicago in education. She taught at the lab school, early childhood education. And then uh, in 1966, she founded Erickson Institute with two of her colleagues. And it's a graduate school in early childhood development. And she's been the president of it twice and she still teaches there to this day. In fact, the reason why she's not here with us this evening is because she's teaching a class. 
at 90. Yeah. So I was going to ask think about, about that. that. Yeah, we're wondering uh, where she was. Yeah. Yeah, she doesn't miss her classes for anything. Um, so you went off to Michigan Law School and you came back to Chicago, uh, worked in a in a law firm at first. And you you know one of the things that you wrote right movingly about is the fact that you got married, and it was not what you imagined. You had made a list of the things you were going to achieve in life, and one of them was get married, have children, um, and the story turned out differently. Uh, yeah, it did turn out a little differently. Um, my plan that David's referring to went like this. I was gonna, well, I went to law school because my best friend was um, two years ahead of me, and she said, well, if your mom won't let you travel, uh, why don't you come to law school? You'll enjoy it. So I go to law school. <laughs> Since you're laughing, I will also confess to you that I considered going to business school, but there was a really good party the night before the GMATs, and I woke up and I was like, nah, I'm not going to jail. <laughs> Just being honest with you guys. Uh, but I thought everybody at Stanford had a plan, like they were going to do this. And I didn't have a burning passion, so I said, well, let me make up a plan. So my plan was go right to law school, probably return to Chicago. If not Washington, I toyed with Washington because I was kind of interested in politics back then. But I would go to law school, probably return to Chicago, find my passion in the practice of law, fall madly in love, get married, have a baby by 30, biological clock ticking away, I was thinking, and then I would live happily ever after, and I would be a working mom and spouse and, and fulfilled in life. So I went right to law school. I came to Chicago. I went to a good firm. I found it boring. I went to an even better firm. I found it even more boring. I uh, married figuratively the Are there boring. any law students here? <laughs> I say this at the law school all the time. It's not for everybody. I don't regret the six years I spent in the private practice because it taught me an awful lot when I stopped practicing in the private sector. I married figuratively the boy next door in that our moms had grown up in the same apartment building that my grandfather managed. Our dads were good friends. Our grandmothers were good friends. He was a doctor. My dad was a doctor. I'd had a crush on him since I was eight and he was 12. What could possibly go wrong with that marriage? Plenty. Enough said on that subject. Uh, I did have my daughter, Laura, just shy of my uh, 29th birthday and best decision I ever made. And I was just watching her on CNN covering uh, the Mueller report. Yeah, she, I was watching her today. She's she too practiced job. law for six years and then had a change of heart. And I'm like, really? I'm so surprised. I told you not to go to a big law firm. Uh, and she pivoted and I pivoted too. And I pivoted when Harold Washington was reelected for his second term. And, uh, first African, -Amer uh, first American, African -American mayor, of mayor of Chicago, for those of you who don't know. And one of my best friends had left his law firm, gone to work for Harold for two years, and was going back. And he said, Valerie, you're so miserable. And I start my book describing my misery in the Sears Tower. They call it something else today. I never remember the name of it. But I was on the 79th floor of that building. And uh, he said to me, you're so miserable. Why don't you join? the law department in the city of Chicago, you will feel as though you are part of something bigger and far more important than yourself. And that resonated with me. And so I, I took this zigzag off of my 10 year plan. I also got a divorce and uh, became a single mom, none of which I would have expected to happen to me 10 years later, but both of them actually changed my life for the better dramatically. Let me, let me just, I, I don't wanna, uh belabor the point about your marriage, but I do want to... We can talk about it. It's all there in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I worked with uh, your ex-father-in-law, Vernon Jarrett, who was a celebrated columnist at the Chicago Tribune. But um, you make this plan and you check these boxes. How... You, you wrote about it, but describe the, the, the pain associated with uh, seeing the thing... All apart, yeah. yeah. Well, I won't say that life had been easy for me, but I will say that with the hard work, my parents' rule that you had to work twice as hard, had come whatever I wanted. You know, Stanford was my first choice for college. I had met a really cute guy who went there in the library at U High, and he had said to me in passing, you should go to Stanford my freshman year of high school. So I was going to Stanford. <laughs> my parents kept saying, you might not get in Stanford. I'm like, I'm going. My mother's like, the cute guy won't even be there when you get there. <laughs> going to Stanford. I got in Stanford, and I got in a great school for law school, Michigan. and and. 
I was determined to make this marriage work. And I just, I fought for it. But what my mother told me, I hadn't really realized, is that I fought for it by, be, by being accommodating. And she kept saying, you know, you're not actually that nice. <laughs> so why don't you be yourself? But I was so busy trying to be the perfect wife. And, you know, I'd come home and I'd make dinner because my mom had always made dinner. Uh, but my dad came home at 5 o'clock. My husband, who was a physician in a residency, never came in. And he never called. And he just wasn't my dad. And I kept trying to will him to be the person he wasn't. And what I say to young people who uh, think that marriage will complete you, and I was one of those kind of uh, stupid young people, is that you have to actually be a whole person first. And that I have never been lonelier than in an unhappy marriage. And that did not occur to me when I was single. I thought, oh, well, marriage will make me happy. And when you realize it doesn't, and that um, nobody else can complete you, and then I'm staring at my child, uh, I realize I better complete myself, because I have to be a whole person for her. And I have to be somebody doing things that she will look up to uh, when she gets older. And I knew if I'd stayed in that law firm, in that marriage, that would not have been the role model that I wanted but she was her. she was seven months old or something when your, yeah. your moved husband Michigan. moved to Michigan. And that was sort of the end of it. Yeah, he moved to Michigan to finish his residency. And I wasn't prepared to say to him, no, you have to stay in Chicago. I was like, okay, find your dream. But I kind of hoped he would stay. And when he chose to go, I... I remember he closed the door when he left, and I thought, oh, my gosh, now what do I do? And I used to stay up until, like, 2 in the morning worrying, and I'd check on Laura. And I'm a 10 o'clock to bed person, so that was way past my bedtime. But I was terrified at first. And then it kind of got good to me that I was calling all the shots, and I was doing what I wanted to do, and I could leave my job at the city and not have to really discuss it since he hadn't discussed his move to Michigan. And I became much more independent, and I learned to take care of myself. Now, I overlearned it to the point of trying to be superhuman and not ask anybody for help. I thought it was a weakness to ask for help. And I, I tell young, particularly young women today, stop trying to be super mom uh, and super whatever your profession is. It's OK to just be good. Like, I used to make baby food from scratch in the middle of the night. Don't do that. Don't. <laughs> particularly after you've worked all day. It's just ridiculous. And, um, and I was pretending, I think, to myself and to my friends and my family that I had it all together. And I did myself a disservice because it's impossible to keep all those balls up in the air. Yeah. And why was I trying to make it look easy when it was really hard? Raising a child by yourself is, is hard enough. Even when my parent, well, first of all, a lot easier for me than a lot of yeah. working moms. I had means to pay for extraordinary daycare. My, um, I could afford to send my daughter and to your the folks lab school. Were here. My father, and mother lived a mile away. My dad took my daughter to school every day and picked her up. And in fact, she wrote her college essay about their trips back and forth to school. And I was afraid when she got her driver's license that she was going to nix that and want to drive. And I gingerly raised, do you think you could still let your grandfather take you a couple of days? And she said, why would I do that? And I said, well, because he enjoys it. She said, no, I mean, why would I drive at all? I, I want him to take me to school. That's my time with my grandfather. I know. It yeah. was like an awe moment, right? And I thought, well, I've done something right here. Um, you did plenty, right? She's but, a, but the, yes, yeah. she's, she's. But my point here is, is that he, I still felt like I was hanging on by my fingertips. And if I felt that way, how does the mom who's working two shifts yeah. at the factory making a minimum wage feel? Which is why I really wanted to chair the White House Council on Women and Girls to figure yeah. out what can we do to make life easier for working families. You not only chaired it, you, you created it. Created it and chaired it for all eight years. Um, I want to ask you about Harold Washington. Um, I, I covered his first election. I worked for him in his second election. I always thought that he was someone who Barack Obama would have really appreciated. He never really got to know him other than leading a protest against him back in 1984 <laughs> when he was an organizer. Uh, but um, tell me what attracted you to him and just give people a sense of what his election meant to this city and to the African American community in this city. Well, he was larger than life. He had a twinkle in his eye and a laugh and a sense of the joyfulness of life and of politics. Uh, he loved a good fight, and when he was when he was elected in the city the city council, 
the majority, the vast majority, 29 of them were against him. And he just would still go at it with them. And they would argue from the floor. And then he'd go back uh, behind the stage and chat with them. And, and he had a vocabulary, like no vocabulary I've ever heard <laughs> in life. I think he made up some of the words. But if it didn't have at least three syllables, he didn't use the word. What do you call his opponent's anti-Diluvian dodo bird? Yes. That's yeah. a great word phrase, isn't it? And, and, and he was a progressive. And I, before Harold Washington was elected, I don't, I don't even think I knew who my alderman was or how many members of the city council there were. I knew that if you didn't pick up the snow, you could lose an election in Chicago, when, like Mayor Belandic That was proven, did, yes. Right? But I didn't really, I wasn't civically engaged because I didn't think that the government really spoke to me. And Harold spoke to me, and he motivated me to want to go out and knock on doors and feel as though I was a part of his movement. Uh, and I did it in both of his elections. Uh, but I mean, like, I mean, literally knocked on doors and said, please go vote. But when he won, I felt an ownership over his election. And I describe in the book after his first election, when he won in 1983, going to work the next day, and I only worked four blocks from my home. I lived downtown, and I had a Herald from Mayor Button, and I could tell from the expressions on people's faces that everybody was shell-shocked. Some people were high-fiving me, and other people were like, oh my God, what's happened to the city? The mayor is black. And he considered himself the mayor of all of Chicago, mm -hmm. and went out of his way to prove that, as I think politicians owe you know, you run your political campaign, and once you're elected, you are governor. You're the govern. You are the governing over the entire city, or the state, or the country. And he got that. And so I think it was a huge victory, not just for the African Americans who live in Chicago, but for all of Chicago. I think it reflected well in our city that a city with its checkered past of discrimination and racism could get. To, could get to the point where it could elect a black mayor, not once, but twice. Yeah, he also bore the scars of, of all of that. He came up in the Democratic machine and then rebelled against votes that he thought were discriminatory, paid a big political price, and came back and became this great independent uh, force. I, I, I want to stipulate a few things, which is you, you spent, you stayed, at, Harold Washington died re, uh, relatively soon after yes. you came to the city which was a tragic thing uh, for the city. And the city had a very tumultuous time after that. You then also stayed uh, when Richard M. Daley became mayor. And I think a lot of people were surprised by that. Uh, why did you stay? And compare Daley to Washington. I stayed because I really liked my job. And by that point, my primary client when I was in the law department, who was my mentor and mentored me and advised me and helped me grow in more ways than I can count, also encouraged me to go ask for promotion, something I would never have done, and pushed me and pushed me and pushed me until I did it, and I actually got it. Um, and she and I did all this great work together, and she stayed through Sawyer. She was hesitant to stay at first, but both she and the head of my department, Judd Miner, both decided that they needed to stay because they didn't trust Sawyer completely, but they wanted to look out we for We should the point city. out to people from outside Chicago, Eugene Sawyer was the mayor who was selected by the city council. He's an African-American, but he really was selected with the support of a Yeah, he was the alderman of the Sixth Ward, and when, when Mayor Washington died, uh, David Moore was the pro tem, so he took over temporarily until the alderman voted on... Um, on a successor, and they voted on Mayor Sawyer. And because he was voted on and received a consensus, the um, black community was very hesitant. And he was kind of old school, political, six ward. Uh, He's a machine guy. Machine guy, that's the word I'm searching for. How could I have forgotten that word from Chicago? He was a machine guy. But we stayed, and then when Mayor Daly won, um, my closest uh, colleague, Lucille Dobbins, left immediately knew she wouldn't have been kept on by Daly, and Judd Minor left immediately, knew he wouldn't be kept on by Daly, and Lucille said, why don't we go start a business together? And I said, mm, I think I might want to stick around. Now, she was not happy about that, and I mentioned in the book, she didn't speak to me for about 15 years. We're now on very good terms again, but it took her a while to So what to made get you think it. she was unhappy? Exactly. <laughs> why, would, why would she just like... But the thing I, I think that... Well, two things happened. One, of childhood friend, dear friend of mine uh, to this day, John Rogers, uh, was close with Mayor Daley, and I don't know exactly how they met, but they were always um, good friends. And in fact, when John married, uh, Mayor Daley was then the state's attorney for Cook County. 
And John sat me at his table, and I complained. I said, John, this is like a family wedding. I know everybody here. Why did you stick me with the state's attorney as opposed to my friends and family? And John said, one day he'll be mayor of Chicago. You're going to be glad that I sat you there. Um, and I was like, I doubt it. But um, John said, you should stick around. You should give him a chance. I know him. I know that he will continue much of the progressive agenda that Harold Washington had begun. And if you don't like it in six months, you can always leave. And I just loved my job back then. So I decided to stick around, and I'm glad I did. Um, while you were at the city, uh, a young lawyer came to see you, a woman uh, from the south side of Chicago. Uh, that, that changed your life and in, in a big way. Uh, yes. Talk, uh, talk she had a lot of... She changed my life, she changed her life. Uh, yeah. So her name was Michelle Robinson, and she was sent to me by Susan Schur, who was the Corporation Counsel for the City of Chicago at the time, who many of you know works here at the university. And across the top of the resume, Susan said, outstanding young lawyer, has no interest in big corporate law firm life, and is interested in public service. And I thought, I wanted to get to know that person. She had great credentials, her resume, Harvard, Princeton. So I call her in and she walks in my office and she is tall and elegant and all in black, her hair pulled back, barely any makeup, shakes my hand, looks me right in the face. She sees her resume on my desk and she never mentioned anything in the resume. She told me her story, a story that we all now know as a quintessential American story, growing up on the South Side, working class family, parents didn't go to college, yet instilled in both she and her brother Craig, um, an appreciation for education and 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 hoped for them to have uh, to go further than her, she and that her parents had gone, and that she was curious about public service. Now I will say to you, it was like a 20-minute informational interview, but after about 20 minutes, I realized that she had changed, turned the tables on me, and she was asking me really hard questions <laughs> that I could not answer. And look, I had just been promoted; I didn't know what we were going to do in the mayor's office. Um, but she was, it was a two-way street in her view. She thought it was important that she find a good fit and not just sell but buy. And I was so impressed with her that at the end of the interview, I blurted out a job offer. Now, I had no authority to offer her a job. I hadn't talked to the chief of staff or the mayor, but I just knew that she was made for public service. In retrospect, they probably approve of your judgment. I think they, well, they did go along with it because a few days later, um, after I had cleared hiring her with them, uh, I was talking to her on the phone, and I said, well, what are you going to do? I would love to have you join me in the mayor's office. And she said, well, we have a problem. And I said, well, what's the problem? And she said, my fiancé does not think it's a good idea. And I said, well, who's your fiancé, and why do we care what he thinks? <laughs> right? And she chuckled, like you're chuckling, and she said his name is Barack Obama, and he began his career as a community organizer on the south side of Chicago, and he has some reservations about me going right into the political uh, fire. You at least were in the frying pan in the law department for four years. I would be going right into the fire. And would you be willing to have dinner with us to talk about it? Now that was a little odd, right? And, and trying to hire somebody and she said, <laughs> you gotta go talk to my fiance. But I was curious, I'd heard about him because being a lawyer, he had a national reputation when he became the first African American president of the Harvard Law Review. Uh, and I'd heard a little bit about him as a community organizer, and I really wanted Michelle Robinson to come and work with me, so I would have gone to do just about anything. And the three of us had dinner, and yes, they both changed my life. You, uh, I'm going to fast forward ahead. You, you were obviously a part of their lives uh, from that point forward. Uh, I, when I was, I think we spoke in 2004 when he decided to run for the. Uh, U.S. Senate, and we obviously spent a lot of time together when he was deciding to run for president. I, re I read uh, it with interest in your book about the night of the Iowa caucuses, uh, and uh, you were there. Yeah, I, w I was there, and I remember what an emotional night it was. But you wrote about riding in the car with Senator Obama and looking over, and what did you see? Well, so Senator Obama, David Pluff, his campaign manager, and Reggie Love, his body guy, all went to visit a caucus site. And you were allowed to go outside of the caucus site, but you couldn't go in. And so we stood outside for about a half an hour, and you had a sense by the people walking in who had Obama buttons that this was going to be a magical night. And as we had drove and driven into the parking lot, 
it was packed. It was a high school, and it was there wasn't a space to park. And David Plouffe, who had great experience uh, with presidential campaigns in Iowa, said, "There's something happening here." And the people who walked in all embraced then Senator Obama and hugged him, and it was quite an emotional experience. And when we got back in the car, we were all pretty overwhelmed with this. And I looked over, and he was tearing up. And I, I think it was like. Well, first he was exhausted, there's one reason. But also just, he always talked about the people who had you know, come straight from college and gone to a part of the country that they knew nothing about and knocked on doors and worked in his campaign as field organizers. Those are the ones that he truly valued the most. And it looked like something might happen. And he knew, and David and David, uh, two of the key, lead key strategists on the campaign had said, if you win Iowa, then there's a possibility that you could actually win the presidency. And he, he, he sensed that this was that moment. And it was a very emotional moment for us. And no sooner than we got back to our hotel to, for dinner, the restaurant for dinner, we found out that the results were coming in sooner than anyone had predicted. And I remember when he was speaking, thinking not only can you win Iowa, not only have you won Iowa, but I think you can actually be president. The reason I raise it is because he has a, a kind of an image of the always cool, always in control. Um, but there are these moments, I, I saw it in Denver, uh, we were practicing his speech for that night, which we had completed like moments before, and he got to a reference to Dr. King, because that was the 45th anniversary of the speech at the Washington, at the Lincoln Memorial. And, um, and when he got to that point in the speech, he, he got verklempt and he asked for a moment and went into the restroom and came out and uh, talked about that it just hit him, the enormity uh, of this. So as much as he projects this image of always being composed, there, is, there, is, there are these moments when, um, when he just can't hold it back. Well, you saw another one the night that he won the reelection in 2012. Yeah. And in Iowa. Yeah, well, there too, and yes, yes, actually, Iowa. There, there was the plane, the last event in 2000. Yes, we went back to Iowa. David's suggestion, you know, go back from where you begin, knowing that it's his last election ever, and he be became very emotional backstage with people who came back who had worked on his first campaign, and and to stand out there uh, and address the folks who really put him on the map in Iowa was emotional. But I was going to mention also when after the election. Um, he oh, went yeah. down to the campaign yeah, headquarters yeah. and he addressed his staff who'd been working again mightily and he got very emotional with them and he said, Mike, because it, cause it was never about him, it was about you. And the fact that people had worked so hard believing in this greater good that we could actually do something about our country and that, that they had been willing to sacrifice so mightily their own personal lives uh, and, and unless they were living with someone on our National Finance Committee, they were not living in good conditions during those campaigns either. But yet magic had happened and he was so grateful and that's where you see the, the, the humanity and the tenderness, I think, in him come out. Speaking of sacrifice, we've spoken about this before um, and she wrote about it in her book, which is, seems to be doing well, Michelle. Pretty well. Um, <laughs> So, best seller you, ever uh, in history. Yeah, I think it's until you knock know. her off the charts. Yeah, exactly. Or, That's not going to happen. Don't do that. I don't think yeah, that, that would be, be good. good for anybody. No, no. <laughs> but, um, uh, but I was very aware. She wasn't really a huge part of his political life, and even in that Senate race, they had an understanding that she had her she had her job here at the University of Chicago. Uh, you know, doing significant things in the community and on health care, two small children. And they had an understanding, and uh, she had a very independent life. All that went out the window uh, when she, when he decided to run for president. Um, and I just was always aware that she was a she was a willing conscript, but she was a conscript, and she made a big sacrifice. A huge sacrifice. So yeah, this political life was not her idea at all. And in fact, when she was when he was considering running for Senate. She got me to orchestrate a brunch to talk him out of it. And not only did we not talk him out of it, but he got me to be his finance chairman. And, and she did have the final word. She said, if you lose, we're done with all this, right? And you're going to go and have a normal life? And he said, yes. So she said, I'm, a, I'm in. But I think she's always... And then voted against him. And then she probably voted against him, right. <laughs> uh, 
she's always been committed to service, as I described from the first time I met her, and certainly before. And this philosophy to those who much is given, much is expected. But politics is not her cup of tea. Serve, yes. Govern, yes. But the politics, she really had no patience for because she knew it wasn't really on the up and up and that people were willing to put their short-term political interests ahead of what was actually good for the country. And she saw that up close, both in the campaign and certainly when we were all and she in was Washington. A, she was a, a target at the beginning of that campaign. And you wrote about it. I think I was the one who orchestrated this. Uh, I wanted to show her how she appeared on TV because she, she would, she was mad at some of the things that were being uh, said about him and about some of the nastiness of politics. But you turn the sound down, and it wasn't, it wasn't a good look. And she was Michelle is someone who demands of herself perfection, preparation, and so on. And she, it was we. We overshot the runway. I think she was pretty devastated by that. So the experience was difficult, and not just during the campaign, but it took her a while when she got to Washington. Yeah, and look, when you were the first, I think they both felt that they were being held to a very high standard. There wasn't a margin for error. Michelle had been very effective on the campaign trail, but as more and more people were attacking him, she did get... Uh, she couldn't believe that people would be attacking either of them the way they were. Uh, they distorted a comment she made when she said she was proud of our country. Uh, people made up like that she said the word whitey. Nobody heard of whitey since Sanford and Son. Nobody was talking that way. She certainly wasn't. Um, and she became, even though she was a spouse, she was being targeted like a principal. And we were not prepared for that. And I felt that I had disappointed her as a friend by not saying sooner you know, you're coming across as angry and you're passionate. And I just thought she's so talented and she's so good. I know she'll win people over. And when David turned down the sound and you could just see the intensity, she appreciated for the first time what was happening. And she could have recoiled and gone back home and taken care of the girls and just said, okay, you're on your own, buddy. But instead... She, she fired me. <laughs> no, 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 she didn't do that. She said, We're, you guys are out of here. <laughs> No, what she did is really what you helped orchestrate was for her to speak at the Democratic Convention and tell her story, that same story that she had told me in my office decades earlier, and to not shy away from the spotlight, but to embrace it and try to use it to be this force of, for good that she wanted to be. But she describes quite poignantly in her book, that was hard, very hard on her and on them. And that we shouldn't treat each other that way. And so when she says, when they go high, we go low, don't think it's easy to always go high, but remember that the children are watching. And that's how she comported herself. And I went with her, interestingly, to Tuskegee. She gave a commencement speech at Tuskegee. And so, of course, I wanted to go visit the campus that was so meaningful to my, my grandfather, great-grandfather. And she spoke to those young people that day and said, I remember this so vividly, she said, People are not gonna always see you in the caps and gowns that you're in today. Know that, but don't let it uh, weaken you because people didn't see me as a first lady. They didn't think I was legitimate. They attacked me, even when I am the first lady of the United States, and that's just, that's with the territory. But you can learn, and I talk about this in the book, to absorb pain without it making you numb or crushing your soul. And that's part of leadership. You put yourself in the arena, you put yourself out there, you're gonna get attacked, and you have to, it's not what happens to you, but how do you deal with it? Uh, let me ask you just about your own years in the White House, and one particular question. You, you were, re you're really family. I mean, you're family to the Obamas. Uh, you've been part of it from the beginning. You had an interview with the fiance, so uh, that tells you something. And um, that's a special relationship, and it gave him, uh, I think, a great comfort to have so many trusted uh, in the White House uh, who he trusted not only to discharge the responsibilities, but to be there as a sounding board and so on. But there are complications with being both family and staff. And I ask, there's like a, some current discussion of that today in the White House as to the advisability of that. Um, what are the pluses and minuses of that? And how do you navigate? And do you ever feel like, do you feel sympathetic to Ivanka and uh, <laughs> just for those, no. for, the, for, those uh, for those who are listening in, there was a, a, a definite uh, shake of the head here. 
Well, the difference, well, let me, let me state it to you this way. Uh, I had had eight years experience on the ground in the city of Chicago, being proximate to our constituents where I learned to listen and I learned to appreciate that government is there to serve you, that you aren't supposed to have to fit your needs into some program coming from the government. Um, I learned about the importance of the legislative and the executive branch of government. I chaired the board of the CTA for eight years. I appreciated regional government and how we had to fit in with Metro and Pace. Uh, I ran, I was CEO of a real estate company, so I understood the private sector. I'd served on literally a dozen boards, both corporate boards and for and not-for-profit boards. I'd had a lot of experience, and yet when I came to Washington, people tried to define me as a first friend as though I hadn't had any of those other experiences. And my responsibilities in the White House, as David, you know, were to oversee the Office of Public Engagement, and I certainly had learned how to do that here in Chicago, the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, the, the elected officials who are not members of Congress. I had lots of experience with that, and a whole range of constituency groups. And so it wasn't as though I came without experience to manage a portfolio. Um, Sounds like you're setting up a, an invidious comparison here. <laughs> No, I was just going to talk about what my credentials <laughs> were. Uh, and as a friend, I knew that in order for, um, well, maybe I am setting up a bit of a comparison. I knew uh. that it was my job to be a part of a team, a very disciplined, organized, structured team that worked hard to develop policy recommendations to present to the president in an in a efficient way because maximizing the use of his time was important. And we prepared lengthy documents which we knew he would read completely. I feel like you're making an invidious comparison. Before coming down to the office. Um, uh, and I knew that as a part of that team, my job was not to go around the process that he had set up and just barge into the Oval Office and give him my opinion. My job was to be a part of that team. And if the team functioned well with me as a part of the team, then he would do well. So I think that's the difference. Do you, um, now you watch what's going on, and many of the things that you work very hard on uh, are, have been targeted by this administration, the, the Affordable Care Act and uh, some of the outreaches to uh, Cuba and Iran and the uh, and and the uh, Paris Accord. I think you were there, maybe when he was uh, made that trip. Um, how do you react to all of that? Elections have consequences, and uh, the way I looked at it is: look, what a privilege it was to serve for eight years uh, in an administration of a president who is like my younger sibling, I'm gonna stop saying that with all that gray hair he's getting, but my sibling, let's call him instead. But what an honor that was for me. And so you expect that you work hard, as hard as you can, and you do it with the recognition that the next person's gonna come along and get to make changes, just like we made changes from President Bush's policies and practices. That's what it means when you win an election. Um, so the pain that I feel isn't for the effort I put in, it's for the people who have pre-existing conditions out there who are now wondering whether or not they're going to have health insurance or and be able to provide for their families and pay their bills or my empathy for the families who have been treated worse than animals seem being separated at the border where they don't even know how to re reunite them because they didn't go through the small bother of matching and keeping data so that they could reunite them. Or the dreamer who I met with in New York at a big company uh, three weeks ago who said to me, I'm only here because of President Obama and I don't know whether I'm gonna be able to stay in this country. Or transgenders who can't serve in the military, which is the most ridiculous thing in the world. Uh, when they wanna sacrifice and pay the ultimate sacrifice to serve our country and you're gonna tell them they're not welcome and obviously the list goes on. And I'm going to be having a grandchild soon, and I'd like to know that <laughs> we're going to leave the climate in better condition than we're finding it. And if we think that climate change isn't real, we should be students of science. And so I can work myself up into like a, a frenzy, not because of my effort or your effort or any of our efforts who had the privilege of service, but because of the impact it's going to have on people here and around the world. Well, I'd like to give you a chance to work yourself into a frenzy, but we have to... We have to say thank you. You're welcome. To, uh, Valerie Jarrett. Thank you. Okay, that was just 
That was just practice because we now have time for questions, so you guys can give her another ovation at the end of those. Um, we have microphones on, I guess a microphone on that side. Uh, so uh, I encourage you, people who have questions, I could continue to ask questions, but. Uh, uh, come on, you guys. I used to be shy. Don't be shy. All right, here they come. That, that was yeah, it. Yeah, that didn't take much, did it? <laughs> How are we going to handle all these questions? Go ahead. And if you could introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Lebu. Um, my question is about the environment at the White House and having lived in and been born in a different country, um, what is the sense of weight in the White House, not only about the problems in the US, but also the recognition that what happens in this country also affects a lot of things around the world? I'm wondering, like, what's the balance of that? Well, it's a heavy, heavy weight is the way I would describe it. That first dinner when I had, uh, when I was with both Michelle Robinson and Barack Obama, he and I talked about uh, just that in the context of my story. So I told him, when he said, where are you from? I said, Chicago, where are you born? Uh, Iran, and I go into, oh gosh, I know it's gonna be an awkward conversation. And instead he said, well, that's interesting. I was in Indonesia during a piece of my childhood. What did you learn from your time in Iran? And we compared notes and we concluded three things. Number one, that we both feel very comfortable walking in any room and we can find something in common with someone in the room because we grew up with people who had language and geographic differences, but yet we found that common ground. And that people who live in the United States sometimes don't appreciate how lucky we are. I mean, my mom had to boil everything I drank and peel everything I ate and worried about diseases that we don't have here. Um, but also that living outside of the United States gives you this perspective that although we are already the greatest country on earth, we're not the only country on earth, and that we can learn a great deal outside of our shores. And President Obama used to say, kind of not really in jest because it was true, that you're not only president of the United States, but when they say leader of the free world, you are really the leader of the free world. And everybody looks to the president of the United States as the leader of the beacon of hope, the democracy that symbolizes what is right and good about democracy. And so when we don't have that, uh, the world becomes more fragile. So not only do we suffer, I think, from what's been rolled back, but the rest of the world feels the full vacuum of our void. Let me just add one thing to that. And I think you, may have, you were probably in the room. I went over after the election in 2008 to the suite at the Hyatt where uh, he, Senator Obama was receiving the returns. The, the most searing memory I have of that night was walking in and seeing, you could almost feel the tension and the stress that, was re that had deposited itself on his shoulders. And I honestly didn't see it go away until January 20th of, uh, of 2017. He took his job very seriously. And it carries with it enormous stress. And I think he handled it maybe too well because maybe he made the job look easier than it is. It's a hard job if you do it right. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Isaiah. I'm a first year in the college. Both on a personal level and on a policy level, it seems like you've spent a lot of time thinking about places and neighborhoods. You grew up in many different places and uh, both uh, in local government and in the federal government, you were concerned yourself with questions of, of housing and, and neighborhood and, and urban development. Something I've been thinking about lately is the notion of good neighborhoods, quote unquote, and bad neighborhoods, quote unquote. Um, and I'm curious um, what your thoughts are on that colloquial phrasing and are there ways that we can trouble the notion of, oh, these are good neighborhoods to live in and that's usually associated with like upper income and white neighborhoods and oh, these are bad neighborhoods. Um, and, and in doing so, in troubling that notion, can we, challenge uh, the idea that uh, maintaining sort of a segregated state to our neighborhoods could be challenge that idea. What an interesting question. So I'll tell you a story that's in my book that I think addresses your, uh, the point that you're trying to make. Before they tore down the Robert Taylor homes, my, uh, I had a dear friend who was head of the housing authority, Terry Peterson, and he asked me if my daughter Laura had ever actually been inside of the Robert Taylor homes, and I said no. And he said, how about before it comes down, we take her through it because there's someone I want her to meet. 
So we go into the Robert Taylor homes, and it is uh, mostly evacuated, but you can smell the stench of the urine. The walls are filthy. The elevators were broken, and so we had to walk up the stairs. When we got to the floor um, that he wanted us to visit, you could see the the um, wiring that we're used to seeing on television uh, where they have the outside corridors. Um, and I tried to imagine what it was like for the kids in the playground down below to know that they were just, you know, target. They could be target practice to whoever was up above. And um, my daughter was really shaken by what she saw until we walked into an apartment of a senior citizen who had moved into the Taylor Homes when uh, it was opened. So she'd lived there her whole life. She'd raised 10 children, all who went off to college. Her home, I described it as going like from black and white to technicolor. Her home was immaculate. Um, uh, she took great pride in it. I said, well, why haven't you moved when your kids moved out? And she said, this is my home. And so when we start describing neighborhoods with labels, such as good and bad, we are doing a disservice to the people who live there. And, uh, and you could, they're good countries and bad countries. I mean, we don't stop at the neighborhood level. But I think what, um, what we all need to do is to go into a neighborhood that we think falls into that description like Robert Taylor Holmes did and see that there are good and decent people everywhere. And it is through that empathy of understanding that I think we can lead to kind of trying to break down some of these artificial barriers that allow us to self-segregate. The restrictive covenants are gone, but yet we still self-segregate. And it's often done based on income, where, uh, which, where the poor black people who were living in public housing had no choice but to live in those neighborhoods, which is why, as commissioner of planning, I was so excited about tearing them down and building back mixed income um, housing, not just racially integrated, but economically integrated, so that people could be with one another and get a better understanding. Being proximate makes a difference. What a good question. My name is Jenny Nyman. I'm a freshman at the Sonia Shankman Orthogenic School. Within the separation between families at the border, what do you think is the most ignored component of that? What is the most ignored component of immigration? Of the separation between families at the border, more specifically. The long-term consequence that that separation will have. I mean, when you speak, as I have, to experts in child development, like the one who's my mom, uh, and, and a good example would be, you've seen some, on TV some of the unifications, reunifications. Look at the expression on the children's faces. It is a devastating long-term consequence to be separated from a parent at such an early age, at any age, but certainly at these early ages. And without any understanding of where they are or will they ever be unified again, and in some cases they are deporting the children and keeping the parents. Well, what's gonna happen to the children when they go back to their home country without their parents? And what's gonna happen to the parents when they have no idea where their children are? If I didn't know where my, when my daughter doesn't return my text in like two minutes, I worry about her and I actually know where she is. It's, you can't breathe if you don't know where your children are. For goodness sake, how could we, this greatest country on earth, do something so inhumane? I don't understand it. Long-term consequences. Even if we fix it, it won't be fixed. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Isabella Hurtado, and I'll be in Iowa this summer with the IOP. And I was just wondering um, what you have seen from this campaign uh, season that's starting up. What excites you? What ideas are being talked about that you are excited about? And what candidates excite you? Well, I think we have an embarrassment of riches, is how I would describe it. And I, I am heartened to see so many people in this toxic climate willing to throw their hat in the race. And I think that's great. And there are many who I think very highly of. I think it's early. As David could tell you, President Obama was probably down by, what, 20 points at this point? Really? A lot of people writing him off. Totally writing him off. And, uh, and so it's early to say who will emerge. I think uh, I'm heartened to see some of them come up with big and bold policy ideas. And I think those ideas should be debated. And uh, one of the comments that he used to make in Iowa that I think applied more generally, I'll t give you two comments he said uh, that will put where we are in context, is that 
He said, you have to be prepared to lift up your hood and let people kick your tires and earn their respect. You're asking for the most important job in the country. No one's going to hand that to you on a silver platter. And in fact, I think, David, you were in the elevator after the New Hampshire primary uh, and had the poor fortune of having to break the news to President Obama that he had lo lost, having been way ahead. Uh, and in fact, on the way back from uh, Dartmouth, where we campaigned the morning of the New Hampshire caucuses, which is never a good idea to go on a college campus on a Saturday morning, I think it was at 9 a.m. <laughs> Whose idea was that? But on our long drive back, I remember what you said that I've never forgotten. He, and you said, look, campaigns have their peaks and valleys, and we probably have many more peaks and valleys before it's over, not knowing we were going to get crushed that night. Yeah. Uh, but that you have to be willing to put yourself out there. And what he said to his wife in the elevator that night was, it shouldn't be too easy. Right. Now, it didn't necessarily have to be as hard as it turned out to be, but it shouldn't be too easy because you have to earn it. And by going all over the country in the primary season, which David had promised me would be over no later than February 5th, my dad's birthday, and in the middle she, of that she, night... She means David Pluff. Yeah, exactly, this one. Because at about 2 a.m., I said to David, who'd been looking at all the returns, did we win or did she win? And he's like, I don't think it's over. I'm like, but you said it would be over. I can't take it, not another day. But... Because it lasted so long, it gave President Obama the ability to travel the country and meet so many people and prove to them and earn their trust. And, and out of New Hampshire came Yes, We Can, which galvanized people. And we learned about him, how he handled adversity. And I think the more you know about a candidate, the better. And so I would suggest to you all that you study up on these candidates, that you figure out which one is the one that reflects your values and your vision, and are you confident that they can execute that vision? What in their track record gives you the confidence that they can do what they say they're going to do? And then go to Iowa and go to New Hampshire and work for them, and if you can't leave what you're doing, you know, make phone calls, which you can make from anywhere. Use your social media tools to participate in this democracy when 43% of eligible voters and young people disproportionately higher opt out. Well, mm-hmm, this, this is what you get. And so if you don't like what you have, you are the only ones who can do something about it. Um, so I'm excited about the field, and, I, and the advice that I've given several of the candidates, including one I spoke to this morning, is look, stay authentic. <laughs> Stay true to what you're about. Don't be busy knocking everybody else in the race. People want to know about you. Um, and, and enjoy it. If you're not looking like you're having fun out there, then who's going to have confidence in you to have fun when you're in the middle of the toughest job in the world? Uh, but I, it's too early for me to say Are who you gonna, I think do you think you, Do you see yourself endorsing a candidate in the primaries? I don't know the answer to that question. Certainly not anytime soon, because I'm enjoying talking to all of them. It's like, I mean, the analogy that my mother gave is like, she had one daughter, and I had one wedding, and she planned my wedding. And so when it was over, she's like, well, now what do I do with all that knowledge of planning a wedding? Well, David and I both have had a lot of experience now with presidential campaigns. So what do you do with all that knowledge? My view is offer it to whoever is asking about it, because I want them all to do well. And, um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't or go know. on cable TV. Or, or go on cable but the, TV. The, um, uh, I just want to tell you as we close here that uh, we do have 60 students going from the Institute of Politics to Iowa. Uh, to They'll choose the campaigns they want to work on. 11 of them, I believe, are going to be working for news organizations. They're covering the caucuses. And there were 157 young people who applied. These are paid internships for this. I think many of them will find their way there uh, as well. So I'm excited about the enthusiasm that I see. And, um, and we're all excited about you coming here. And this book, this great book, is going to be available out there, and Valerie's going to be signing them. And I really encourage you to read it, because it's a really honest and open book. And as you can hear, she's got uh, just a wealth of experience and an incredible story. So it's well worth the, well worth the time. Valerie, thank you. Thank you all.